Welcome everyone. I'm Brian. This is Faith on Fire and that's Mike Winger. He's got a great channel. Very popular too. I enjoy watching him on occasion. And of course, because of the nature of the content I often share on this channel about the role of women in the churches, um, this is uh, this is the I think the fourth installment of his. I think he said he's going to do seven videos on this whole thing about the role of men and women in the church. And this one in particular, I'm looking forward to. And I want to talk a little bit about this. This is not going to be a critique of his video, even though I'm egalitarian, he's complementarian. Uh, although he considers himself a very soft complementarian, as he explains in his first video. I've done videos on this very topic here. Apostles, elders, deacons, looking at the most controversial passages in Scripture and providing the proper context and explaining what they mean. And I, I want to share another insight. That's, this is why I'm talking about Mike Winger's channel. And like I said, this is, um, this is a methodology type of thing, not so much criticism, but in his videos... Mike spends a lot of time reading from books about some complementarianism uh, uh, or scholars, some egalitarian scholars. And to his credit, he looks at what they says, and then he looks at what the Bible says and shows where maybe they exaggerated or they just flat out interpreted the Bible wrong or they're really, really reaching for something that's just not there. And in such doing, you know, he's basically debunking egalitarianism. And... I want to explain how my methodology uh, is vastly different than, than his. When I watch him talk about what some of the egalitarians wrote, um, I'm glad I never wasted my time reading their books, number one. But secondly, I kind of think, well, who cares what they say? I don't even agree with what they're saying either. But I still come to the same conclusion as they do, and why is that? And So my methodology has always been very simple. I read the Bible, and I really couldn't care less what commentaries say, what authors say what the scholars say I care what God says and there are those who when you say I believe women should be pastors and uh, preachers even to men teaching men and they go well you reject the Bible because you reject what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14 34 and 35 1 Timothy 2 11 and 12 roles of elders and deacons uh, in Titus 1 1 Timothy 3 wrong. <laughs> I, I always find it interesting. And I know that there are egalitarians out there that actually do say that they don't believe Paul really meant that. And someone else inserted it into scripture and they kind of reject that. Well, I would not agree with them on that matter, even though we come to the same conclusion about egalitarianism. Uh, I believe all the Bible. I read the King James Bible. That's what I trust. Doesn't mean I don't read modern Bible versions too, but I defer to the King James Bible. And I think it's very different in some respects on these key passages than what you see in model bi modern Bible versions because the bias of men was inserted into the translation, which changes the meaning drastically in a lot of these things. And in the first video Mike Winger did, he talked specifically about inserting our own bias into Scripture when we read it and how we shouldn't do that. And I totally agree with that. And so when I was a complementarian, and this was before I even knew these terms, I mean, I just... I grew up believing that women weren't supposed to be leaders in the church and not supposed to be pastors or, or preach to men. The, I thought, like a lot of people say to me, the Bible's perfectly clear on that, isn't it, right? Well, it, it's, not, it's not clear on that. In fact, it, it's, it's quite uh, confusing because of Paul commending women who do those very things and how God launched the church, which is not the same as the institution of marriage, by the way. The institution of the church is quite different. And when God launched the church at Pentecost, he had women among the 120 preaching to men. And if you don't think that's true and you think just Peter was preaching and 3,000 were saved, go read it again. You'll see in Acts 1 of the 120, there were women who followed Jesus that were among them. And the, the, the Spirit of God gave all of them utterance. And they went out and preached. They all went out and preached. The focus then goes on to Peter. But if you read a little further in Acts chapter 2, Peter even... Uh, reiterates Joel and how in the end times your your daughters, uh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Well, prophesy doesn't necessarily mean you're talking about the future of what's going to happen, but you're you're stating what God says, which might already be evident in Scripture, but you're prophesying the word of God. That's a lot of times in the Bible, that's all a prophecy means. And so in the end times, when people are going to be speaking the word of God, prophesying, it's not necessarily what God is going to do in the future that's not in the Bible, but actually stating what's in the Bible, which is sort of like preaching the Word of God. And clearly, 
sons and daughters will be doing this. So we have women who launched the early church by preaching along with men. Why would God change that suddenly? <laughs> and then he's going to end the end times with men and women prophesying, which is like preaching the word of God to others. And some people are so legalistic, they'll go, oh, okay, I get it. Well, women can preach you know, outside and things like that and evangelize, but they just can't do it inside a church building. Really, do we really believe that God's that legalistic that the moment a woman crosses that threshold of a church door, she's got to be silent suddenly? That, that's, that's irrational. It's, a, it's ridiculous. That's Pharisee-like thinking as well. And it doesn't jive with the early church because there were no church buildings in the early church. There was just house churches. And Phoebe went around to the Roman house churches reading from the letter Paul gave her, which was we call it the Book of Romans. That's the inspired Word of God. And she went and read it to all those people. That's why he sent Phoebe and called her a deacon. So you could read 1 Timothy 3 and verse 12 and say, well, Paul said deacon's got to be husband of one wife. Well, that's a little confusing since he called Phoebe a deacon. Well, I go into this a lot in, in the channel. And so number one point of this video is I want to state that I don't get my authority from anything but scripture. I don't read egalitarians. I don't read complementarians. I couldn't care less about those biblical scholars. I read what the Bible says, and that's how I get my interpretation and understanding scripture. And in doing so, in time, since I pray, Holy Spirit, come in, lead me, right? Heavenly Father, have the Holy Spirit lead me in wisdom and truth. That's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. And I love reading the Bible every day, and on occasion, it happens quite a bit, actually, finding something new, even though I may have read a passage countless times in the past, I just see something new in it now, and I, the light bulb goes off. Those are aha moments. I love it, and I credit God for teaching me through the Holy Spirit in those moments. And so I changed my view to egalitarian because of my understanding of Scripture becoming more and more in-depth over the years. Not to say that his is not in depth, but he's remaining a complementarian, as he said. I respect that. He, that means he believes the Word of God is true, and he interprets it a certain way. I believe the Word of God is true, all of it inspired by God, and I interpret it, in this case, a slightly different way. What I do like about Mike Winger, and I would recommend him, of course, there's lots of things we do agree on. As a matter of fact, of the three things I talk about debunking most on this channel, number one is Calvinism. Um, I don't go into depth in that too much. There's other people that do better than me, but I do mention it. When I talk about John MacArthur, Justin Peters, these are Calvinists. What ha goes hand in hand with that a lot of times, but it's not exclusive to them, is cessationism. So that's the second thing. I absolutely think Calvinism and cessationism are heresies. They are blasphemy. And, and so I'm not going to go into that. I cover that in other videos to some degree. And like I said, other people do that better to me. But just in a nutshell, Calvinism is a Gnostic philosophy inserted into Scripture. It's not there. And predestination and election are there. And it means certain things very clearly is written out in the text. And it does not mean what the Calvinists say it means about salvation and everyone being predetermined from the foundation of the earth in Ephesians 1 to be either uh, elect to go to heaven or not elect to go to hell. That's not what it means. And I don't really want to take the time to, to but Mike Winger agrees with me. He debunks Calvinism in at least two of his videos that I've seen. And I'm not sure what his role on cessationism, to be honest with you, but uh, certainly in this role of the women, that's the third item I talk probably the most about, the role of men and women in the church today based on what the Bible says. And so he and I will have a slight disagreement on the conclusions of interpreting Scripture and the key passages relating to that. But I want to show you something real quick. Okay, we're in 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to scroll down to 15 and 16, verse 15 and 16. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord's salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Peter's talking about what Paul wrote to brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which that which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here is Peter uh, admitting, depending on what Bible version you'll see, you know, it, it basically is the same meaning. And that is some of what Paul writes is confusing. And some people who just don't know what the heck they're talking about, um, or even possibly for um, ulterior motives, will twist the word of Paul the writings of Paul, to mean something else. And that's why 
although this is not a core essential of the faith, this whole role of women in the church, uh, it, it's it's still a hotly debated item. And somebody's wrong. <laughs> you know, I firmly do not believe it is me, and I have no ulterior motive, and I'm certainly not new at this when it comes to reading the Bible and understanding it. So uh, I'm not unlearned, and I am not, uh, uh, I, you know, for instance, um, I do this channel for free in my spare time. It's not my real job. And I don't ask for donations or anything. I don't know. Maybe one day it'll be a full-time thing, and I will. I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball on that. But probably not, if I had to guess. That's not my goal. I just like to share what I learn in the Bible with other people and what, what, what I am passionate to talk about and sharing the gospel. Now, let's go over here. 1 Timothy 2. This is the one of the most common controversial, or this section right here, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. A usurp authority is from the Greek word authentine. The only time in scripture that version, that Greek version of, of authority is used. And authentine means to illegally t or take by force. Uh, it's not a rightful authority. It's a wrongful type of authority. Um, and so that's why in the King James Bible, the word usurp authority is inserted because usurp means to illegally or by force take. And then you add the word authority to it, and then you have basically a perfect translation of authentine from the Greek. Um, exousia is the Greek word used in, for authority every other time in Scripture, which is well over a hundred times. Authentine shows up once, and this is it. You think Paul who wrote Exousia and other places. Think of the, uh, Jesus said, I have been given all authority under heaven and earth. That's a rightful authority he has. Exousia is the word used in Greek, not authentine. This is the only time it's said, but that's not the reason I really went here. I'm just giving you a, a view of a King James Bible translation versus modern translations that say, um, like modern translations, they have a bias, right? In, in Mike Winger's first video, he talked about inserting your bias. Well, translators do that too. In verse 12, they, they have uh, nor to have authority over men instead of the man. They, and by the way, this is a clear reference. Adam, verse 13, for Adam and Eve, uh, for Adam was form, formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. It was in the transgression. What is Adam and Eve's relationship with one another? Hello, they were married, right? So Paul's reference, the marriage of Adam and Eve, going back to the very beginning, to establish this concept that a woman, singular, is not to teach or usurp authority, I mean, illegally take authority over the man. The man is singular. It means the husband. He is writing about the relationship, not between men and women in the church, but, me, but men and women who are married together. Because in marriage, you have patriarchy and complementarianism. Equal in the sight of God, different roles. That's what it means. That's established throughout Scripture. But in the church, Jesus is the head of the church. The rest of us are the body. And our roles in the body of Christ as born-again believers has nothing to do with our gender. has nothing to do with who we're married to. Our marriage is separate from church. Our role in the church, as all members are the bride of Christ, is he's the head, we're the bride, we're the body, we're the born-again believers. And what determines our role? The, holy, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Nowhere... In Scripture, in the New Testament, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are uh, illustrated and wrote about, does it say in any one of the passages, not one, no matter who writes it, including Paul in Ephesians 4, not one time does it say women are excluded from certain gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in Ephesians 4, Paul specifically writes about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Three of the four he mentions is evangelism, teaching, and pastoring. Now, you would think Paul would then say, but those are only eligible to men to be consistent, right? But he doesn't. Instead, he says, this is for perfecting the saints, doing the work of ministry, and edifying the body. So the reason I came to 1 Timothy 2 was actually for verses 3 and 4. Read this with me. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Think about that for a second. Um, does God want women to be saved? Or is, talk about when Peter said things were confusing, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. That sounds like a lot of works there. That seems like a lot of work salvation. We know Paul didn't teach work salvation, so that's a little confusing. Let's go up here and just understand 
that almost every single time in the King James Bible, and probably modern Bible versions too, when there's a talk about salvation, being saved, um, sins forgiven, the core essentials of Christianity, every time it's written to men. Even 2 Timothy uh, 3, verse, I think, 16 and 17, talks about the inspired word of God. Let me show you that one. It's about, it's going to say about men. No, women are not mentioned. Okay, here it is. Famous verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This kind of masculine writing, directing it to, towards men, was not excluding women at all. It was the writing style. And you could find literally hundreds of Bible verses in the New Testament that we apply universally to both men and women relating to the core essentials of the faith of Christianity. But if you really look closely, you'll see that it's written and it specifically says this is for men. Nowhere does. But when these complementarians get to those key Bible passages that seem to prohibit women from a certain role, like in 1 Timothy 3, qualifications of elders and deacons, they go, look, it says right here, if a man desires the office of bishop, it's a good thing. He must be blameless, the husband of a wife. And they stop right there and they go, see, the husband of a wife prohibited to women because women can't be married to a wife. So instead of applying the obvious truth that Paul upheld God's biblical view of marriage between a husband and a wife, and he's writing in the masculine form, and he's calling Phoebe in Romans 16 a deacon. You put it all together, and you can clearly see that the role of elders and deacons are, in fact, for men and women, just like Scripture is written for men and women, not just the man of God, just as in 1 Timothy 2, also written by Paul, who will have all men to be saved, means all men and women. Women aren't left out of the salvation equation and the promise of God for the grace that, which is eternal life. So I want to mention one other thing re relating to this authority issue down here. The, I believe it's still the most popular video on my channel. And that was a seven minute, I'm not on that video. I uploaded a seven minute video of Ann Graham Lotz preaching at the DC mall uh, at the event called The Return uh, a year and a half ago or so, something like that. And uh, it was, it was kind of when the channel was somewhat new because uh, this channel is only about maybe a year and a half old. And I was really inspired by her seven-minute sermon, speaking and preaching to a mixed audience. Jesus is still on the throne. Wonderful sermon, very inspiring. So I captured that, uploaded it with no commentary from me whatsoever. Just the seven minutes and Graham Lotz. And you wouldn't believe, not only is it the most popular, I think I got, uh, last I checked, like something like 27,000 views on that video. And I think 100% likes and every comment I see and I still see comments coming in every once in a while these days but it went, it went like crazy when it was initially uploaded tons of people watched it and men and women alike were inspired by it and wrote positive comments uh, how great that was how great she is how great the word is how timely it was whatever no one said anything about oh how dare she how dare she preach to a mixed audience of men and, and yet it when I go do a video and talk about these these pa pa uh, passages from Paul, and I say maybe the interpretation shouldn't be universal, maybe you know let's look at some other context. What women did in the Bible, even though there's not a whole lot of examples of it, there are examples. What did they do? Does it contradict that? God's word doesn't contradict itself. So since God's word doesn't contradict itself, maybe our interpretation of what Paul wrote in these other passages need to be changed to understand it a little better. So it's not contradicting what Paul wrote about other women. So uh, I do that and people just jump all over me. Oh, you're rejecting the Bible. Oh, you're rejecting the word. And women don't deserve, it shouldn't be preaching. And that's an abomination of God. That's just, you know, rebellious. I mean, people jump all over it when you do a video on the topic of complementarian and egalitarian. But they love the video of a solid preaching from a woman. I find it amazing. And here's the other interesting thing. When I listened to Anne Graham last preach, I didn't sense my authority was being usurped one bit. Didn't ever occur to me. It was uplifting. It was a good message. It b built my faith. Uh, it was timely. It was great. And I don't think anyone who watched it had their authority. Any man who watched it had their authority usurped. She wasn't usurping anyone's authority. She's just preaching the word of God. Exactly what Jesus told us to do 
in the Great Commission, the last thing he said to all his followers before he ascended to heaven. And I, I'm pretty certain it'll be the first thing he asks us about when he returns or we return to see him, whichever comes first, right? Either we're going to die or he's going to come back. But one day we're going to meet our maker. And that first question might be, what did you do with the commandment I left you with? How many people did you reach? So I really want to end this video now and just simply say I, I really encourage other people to watch Mike Winger's, even though he slightly disagrees with me. I think there's a lot to be learned from him. He goes, he does videos a lot longer than I do. I, I don't have the patience to, to, to do hour and a half, two hour videos. Um, and I don't even have the patience to watch his all the way through, to be honest. I, I watch like a half an hour here, come back later, watch another half an hour, maybe another time, watch another half an hour and just kind of break it up. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in what people's thoughts are. Hopefully I've covered everything I, I intended to here. And uh, with that, may the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye.